22, 1940. The fighting had only been going on for a few weeks when France surrendered and signed the armistice at Rotonde. It was a humiliation followed by the occupation of the northern half of France and the Atlantic coast by the Wehrmacht. 300,000 German soldiers made Paris their headquarters. Everything was requisitioned for their administration, their offices, their soldiers. They took over completely, both materially and symbolically. They had complete hold over the capital and surrounding region. Soldiers fired up by the conquest had a very stereotypical image of Parisian women. French women wore makeup totally differently from German women. They were seductive and flirtatious, and their morality left a lot to be desired. The soldiers were on the lookout for women like this, who were both mysterious and tempting. But the Wehrmacht was wary of venereal diseases. Plus, Hitler expressly forbade soldiers from having sex with French women to prevent contaminating the Aryan race. German soldiers had to be prevented from having sexual relations with women who were not racially pure enough for the Nazi state. French women were not considered to be on the same level as Aryan women, although they weren't as low down the scale as Jewish or Slav women. The punishment for breaking the law was simple. German soldiers would be sent to the front line to become cannon fodder. Nevertheless, a reckless young reserve officer, 24-year-old Joseph von Mirlo, crossed the red line with a Parisian woman, Raymond Bouton. Josiane van Mirlo, the child born from their illicit affair, has dug up the archives. These are my parents' diaries, covering the period from 1942 to the end of the war. This is a real treasure and has enabled me to reconstitute the entire wartime period from both sides. Josiane's father, Joseph, came from the conservative working classes who opposed Hitler. He nevertheless earned a scholarship from the Reich to study medicine. In return, he was forced to join the Hitler Youth. My grandfather was totally against my father joining the Hitler Youth, so this was a huge family conflict. My grandmother cried, so my grandfather finally gave in, but he told my father he never wanted to see him in the house wearing that disgusting uniform. Joseph was drafted into the Wehrmacht in 1938 and transferred to Paris in the summer of 1942. He was a charmer, a ladies' man, and lived in a requisitioned apartment in the 16th district. Once the euphoria of being in Paris had worn off, he got tremendously bored. He realized the French were hostile towards them, and they rarely went out. One day, my father noticed a very beautiful woman sunbathing on a lounger on the balcony in the apartment block opposite, and he decided he was going to win her over. The pretty young woman in the building opposite was Raymond Bouton. She was 29 years old and was living in the apartment of her employer, who had fled to the southern zone. Along with eight million other French men and women, she was married to Oscar, who'd left to go work in Germany as a volunteer. She'd married an Italian mason, but they weren't compatible. He was very violent, he was jealous, and he had other bad character traits, so the couple didn't function well at all. On August 28, 1942, armed with rudimentary French, Joseph and his superior officer turned up at Raymond's. She was with her sister, Odette. The two women were scared because they'd been listening to the news from London on the radio and thought they'd been denounced. They didn't know if these officers were from the Gestapo. But within five 15-minute visits, according to Raymond's diary, the young woman was under the spell of the enemy soldier. He had quite a pronounced crooked nose. His hair color was indistinct. My mother called it oxtail color. He wasn't what you would call a handsome man. And yet, for Raymond, it was love at first sight. 
She'd found someone who was very gentle, very kind, someone who was cultivated and who looked after her and pampered her. As for him, he'd found someone who had more sexual experience than him, despite his reputation. And so from the very beginning, it was a passionate love affair. This is what Joseph, feeling very pleased with himself, wrote in his diary about his meeting with Raymond. Wednesday, August 26, 1942, he wrote Ina Raffinierta tour, so an exquisite visit along with his boss, whom he names, to get to know Raymond and Odette. And he added a little secret sign, an oblique stroke through the letter O. I realized later this meant he'd had sex when he did this, and this occasion must have been particularly good, because there was an exclamation mark alongside. He was a randy devil, it has to be said. How many women in August 1942 got into bed with the enemy like this? The exact number is impossible to know. What is certain, though, is that these dangerous love affairs started in the very first months of the occupation. Very quickly, German soldiers were seen with young French women out walking and on cafe terraces together. In a symbolic way, the link-ups between French women and German men, while Frenchmen were away fighting, took on a significant meaning, secretly shocked many, and started to become an issue. Prohibiting relationships with the enemy was applicable to the French, too. Despite the Vichy government's famous 1942 slogan, family, work, motherland, adultery became a national issue. For the first time, the state could prosecute an adulterous woman. Whereas before, it was only considered a family matter. And in the case of wives of war prisoners, the state could even prosecute the adulterer without the husband's consent or desire. By committing adultery with her German officer, Raymond was risking up to two years in prison. But it didn't seem to worry her and she continued to live dangerously. In a matter of a few days, her life was thrown upside down. Her husband, her marriage, her work, and her family. She followed my father everywhere, even into the red zones, where she had no right to go. According to Josiane, Raymond was well aware that she was breaking the Vichy laws, but she had no fear. I think her love came before everything. It was sacred. And she didn't believe she was doing any harm by sleeping with my father. Having a love affair was, to a certain extent, a way of escaping from everyday life. It was about living differently, about trying to come up for air in a drowning world. Except that in wartime, falling in love could be very costly. In November 1942, Raymond and her officer were reported to the Wehrmacht. She was just sent home, but Joseph was immediately transferred to the Eastern Front, which at this stage of the war was like a slaughterhouse. It was a death sentence. Out of 640 men in the regiment, my father was among only 43 survivors at the end. The rest had been killed. My father was seriously wounded. A Russian shell had exploded right next to him, so he was taken behind the lines in an air ambulance. After 18 months on the Eastern Front, Joseph returned alive, but seriously wounded. It was a miracle. He'd tell me about being in the trenches and how the Russian soldiers were extraordinarily quiet and crept up on them like felines. Knives between their teeth, they attacked the dispatch riders who were on the outposts of the trenches. They'd kill anyone they could, and when they did, they cut off the testicles and tied them around the necks. My father also told me that when they captured Russians, it wasn't a pretty sight either. After the Eastern Front, Joseph was transferred back to France. He'd come face to face with death, but it didn't take him long to carry on where he'd left off with his French mistress. He went almost at once to the town of Orsay. This is my favorite photo of my parents. Dad is in full uniform with his officer's cape. And I think Mom looks beautiful in her hat and black coat, vamping it up a bit like Greta Garbo. They had no qualms about walking together dressed like this all over the town and surrounding areas. But it did lead to trouble later on. 
If one was dating a German soldier, it wasn't just considered as a simple love affair, but as a deliberate desire to be seen openly with the occupying enemy in the streets of the village or town that you lived in. It was no small thing. Despite all this, the couple were blatantly on show. In Orsay, as well as in Cailloux-sur-Mer, a small coastal village within the Atlantic Wall, where Joseph had been transferred. One evening, the couple even dared to fool around in the blockhouse. And were interrupted by the general in charge of coastal defenses, none other than Rommel himself. Dad pushed her into a storage space, separated by a curtain. It was where the bins were kept, and Mom stayed in this tiny space during the inspection. She heard footsteps get nearer and stop just in front of the curtain, and she heard the general ask my dad a question. He said, what's behind this curtain? And my father replied in an incredibly casual way, oh, it's just where the bins are kept. There was a silence. Mom felt her heart miss a beat, and then the general went away. If he'd pulled back that curtain, she and my dad would have been shot. After that, she never went back to that blockhouse. The forbidden couple narrowly avoided being executed. Raymond and Joseph had to be much more careful from then on. But the war had other ideas. From 1940 onwards, 1,800,000 French prisoners were taken across the border into Germany. They were sent to 70 different war camps throughout the Reich. A large majority of the prisoners spent most of their time of imprisonment outside of the camps. They were supposed to be there at nighttime, but during the day they worked outside of the camp. Obviously, having regular close contact with German families led to affinities gradually developing, and of course, some of these turned into full blown relationships. Dangerous relationships, nevertheless. It was absolutely forbidden for prisoners to have relationships. Any relationship with a German woman was clearly punishable by death. And yet half of the soldiers, whose average age was around 30, had left behind a wife or a fiancé in France. These men had nothing but letters to help maintain a semblance of conjugal ties. Among the prisoners was a certain Maurice Robert, whose family name is still a mystery to Gertrude Kochtan. This 90-year-old still lives in northern Germany, in the Schweren region on the Baltic Sea coast, with her daughter, Barbara. For the first time, she's decided to talk about her affair with Maurice Robert, who was at the time a prisoner in Stalag 2E. He had dark brown hair. He was tall and slim and very elegant, a handsome man. He must have been six or seven years older than me, I think. Gertrude was just a teenager at the time, and in her family, politics were hardly ever talked about. We were just happy to be alive and have food to eat. We weren't interested in politics. We were just a poor family and we just didn't get involved. Gertrude wasn't politically aware. As a teenager, she was more concerned with first love. While prisoners of war were taking up the jobs left by the 20 million Germans who'd been sent off to the front line or to occupied zones. The prisoners were allowed to move around freely, especially the French ones. Maurice worked in the sawmill. He could be seen in the courtyard unloading tree trunks and carrying them to the workshops. In Schwerin, 8,000 of the 9,000 prisoners were French. There were some Polish prisoners and two or three Russians. I remember the Russians would sweep the courtyard. We all got on very well at the factory. We were like a large family. And all the prisoners had a girlfriend. During this period, Gertrude would make daily visits to the water pump, which was located just opposite Maurice Robert's camp. And that's where we met. I'd come to get some water, 
And he was there. We were young. And it was love at first sight for me. He spoke a bit of German. But we used a lot of sign language to communicate. Of course, I was a little bit afraid of being reported. But when you're young and in love, you don't really think about it. Gertrude didn't think about it, but the Nazi regime certainly did. Any relationship, be it verbal, sexual, or loving, was prohibited between German women and prisoners of war for racial reasons. Mixing with non-Aryans was forbidden. If ever the authorities found out that any of us were having a relationship with a prisoner of war, then they would have shaved our heads and paraded us through the town. And then we would have been sent to a concentration camp, for sure. German women who were caught having sexual relations risked between one year's imprisonment and two or three years of forced labor. And for other types of relationships, such as regular conversations, exchanging of food items and so on, the punishments varied between fines and several months in prison. Even so, Gertrude wasn't able to tear herself from her first love. I've always considered that there's no difference between a German man or a French man. A man is a man. Love is the same in either country. To avoid going to prison, or worse, death, Maurice Robert and Gertrude tried as hard as they could to stay discreet and change their meeting places all the time. We were always on the lookout for secluded spots, outdoor places where no one would suspect us of being. It was vital that absolutely no one could see us. Nevertheless, the inevitable happened. During one particular romantic tryst, everything changed for Gertrude and her lover. They heard a noise in the forest, footsteps approaching. We ran, and Maurice managed to get away. But they caught up with me, and they immediately suspected me. A civilian had clearly caught the young German woman with the French prisoner. She knew that if she was denounced, she could well be deported. Her love affair with Maurice Robert might lead to her downfall. 200 miles away, Berlin, the capital of a huge territory. This building, which survived the bombardments, was home to the passionate love affair of Lili Vus, codenamed Aimé, and Felice Schreigenheim, alias Jaguar. One was a mother of four children and wife of a Nazi bank clerk, and the other woman was a clandestine Jew throughout the whole war. This is uh, Friedrichs Hallerstrasse 23 where Lily and Felice spent uh, 16 months together in apparent safety. It was an, a nest. Two of the children were in the countryside to protect them. And when Lily went out to do shopping, then Felice would take care of her. And later on, she had a job, and they lived a normal family life, yes. Yes, and Felice was convinced that she was, would survive the war. Lily was 29 years old when she met Felice, her lover-to-be. She was a model housewife, having been awarded the Reich's Bronze Merit Medal for motherhood, so nothing suggested that she would abandon herself to a homosexual love affair. Her life was very... Um restricted, you know. She spent her time in the house taking care of her kids, cooking, and, but she was no happy housewife. She didn't really um, uh, want to be what she was. It was a petty bourgeois household, I would say. Except that Lily's husband was hurriedly called up by the Wehrmacht, and the young housewife soon discovered an unusual hobby collecting lovers. Her housemate Ulla was the one who organized her amorous rendezvous. After a while, Ulla introduced her to Felice Schragenheim. She was homosexual, Jewish, and of German nationality. 
as were the majority of the 520,000 Jews in the country pre-war. She came from a liberal Jewish family, like there were so many in, uh, in Berlin at the time, um, well-to-do. Her father was a dentist, her mother was a dentist, but her mother was already, well, both were dead by the time they met. Felice was orphaned before the Nuremberg Laws came into force. She received her deportation order in 1942 and immediately went into hiding. She had some false documents, which weren't very good. Being in hiding uh, in Berlin meant having to organize your food because you didn't have any rationing, food rationing. So you had to buy food or you buy rationing cards from people. So you needed money. She was only 21 years old and was one of 10,000 clandestine Jews in Berlin. The only Jews uh, in Berlin who, who uh, spent the war in hiding in Berlin uh, they were all young people who had money. They managed to get through the war, but it was only 1,500 Jew Jews who, who survived in hiding. At the time, Lily knew nothing of this underground world and was like a majority of Europeans, anti-Semitic. One day, Lily had said to Ulla that she could smell Jews. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Felice, she had a lot of humor. She said to Ulla, look, I would like to meet this woman and I would like to see whether she really can smell Jews. So that's how they got together. Felice was an extremely bright woman with an almost magnetic charm. For someone who had never come across any homosexuals, Lily discovered a new world. Suddenly her house filled with uh, laughter and with dancing and with music. She discovered something completely new, which she hadn't known before. And um, immediately she understood, yes, this is what I want. The love affair started in 1943 and was doubly risky for the two women. Relationships between Aryans and Jews were punishable by deportation and the death penalty and homosexual love was considered as unnatural under the Third Reich. Homosexuals were always sentenced to the worst types of forced labor, into what were called disciplinary commandos. This showed that there was massive segregation between the heterosexual deportees and the homosexual ones, who were placed apart, to avoid any form of contagion. This didn't deter the model Reich housewife from being reckless. Three months after they first met, Lily fell for Felice, the homosexual Jew. A life-changing event that Lily told journalist Erica Fisher about years later. She immediately fell in love uh, with uh, Felice. The sex that they shared was very exciting for her. And actually, it was the first time that she experienced an orgasm. This she told me, yeah. So she had four children, but without orgasms. <laughs> and um, um, and she, she liked it very much. So there was something in her that was prepared to accept this, the, this new life. Lily begged Felice to come and live with her. Her lover accepted and then a month later confessed that she was a clandestine Jew. The reaction of the Nazi bank clerk's wife was unexpected. She immediately said, uh, I don't care, I will protect you. Uh, now even more so, I'm going to love you. She was a passionate uh, person. She just threw herself inside and um, she forgot <laughs> in which kind of regime uh, she was actually living and that one had to be very careful. Lily did everything to hide not only Felice's identity, but their love affair too. Lily uh, 
uh, told her neighbors that she was her cousin who was who came from Frankfurt and uh, whose flat had been bombed. And this was a completely normal thing during the war. It was also very normal because all the men were gone, that women would go out together to cafes, that women even would dance with each other. So this was nothing that um, attracted any attention. A husband at war far away, two cousins living together was a credible cover. But was it purely for survival that the young Jew Felice cultivated her love affair with Lily? I do think that it was ideal for her to uh, live uh, in the house of a woman who was known as a good, um, well, wife of a Nazi. It might have been her strategy. I do believe that, they, uh, that she liked Lily, yeah. because towards the end, um, the only person to whom she wrote letters was Lily. Six months after they first met, the Gestapo declared that Felice was a fugitive. And from then on, she was a wanted woman. It was her Jewish identity that drove their forbidden love off the cliff. At dawn on June 6, 1944, a flotilla of 7,000 ships landed on the Normandy beaches. This was Operation Overlord, one of history's greatest military campaigns. Among the troops were 156,000 Americans. The myth of the GI was born. The typical GIs were seen as tall, strong, blonde-haired guys, always chewing gum. The chewing gum was true, as was the Coca-Cola. They came from all parts of America, and not just New York. They had come over to a part of the world they didn't know, nor had even heard about. Among them was 19-year-old Roger Rusher, nicknamed Rod. One woman has never forgotten him. Now, 90 years old, we found her in the heart of Montana in the U.S. Huguette Coflon has been living here since 1946. She was originally from France. He was good looking, <laughs> but maybe to me, I don't know, you know, he was dark and curly and <laughs> tall. All right, yeah. He graduated from school and he went straight to, to the war. In order to better understand the people that they had just liberated, American soldiers were provided with some useful tips. They all had a little booklet with simple information telling them about French life, reinforcing all sorts of stereotypes, such as French women having loose morals, the French being dirty, complaining all the time, and so on. The American chiefs of staff warned their troops against a real danger, venereal diseases. So on missions, American soldiers were forbidden from having sexual relations with French women. But when the American soldiers liberated Paris on August 25, 1944, after two months of fierce warfare, the Parisian women welcomed their heroes with open arms. It's true that women jumped up onto the tanks, holding flowers and all of that. It was as if everything had opened up again, especially for young people who'd spent four years of hardship. It was almost as if a black veil had been torn down all of a sudden. Huguette was a student at the time, and her parents had sent her to live with her grandmother, 20 miles from Paris. This is how she remembers the arrival of the Americans. When they first came, everybody was happy because we were free, we were getting rid of all those uh, terrible Germans, you know? So, but pretty soon, we didn't want them. the people in the store. Uh, when they're starting to have stuff to, to feed, they wouldn't give it to the French people, they would give it to the American because they give more, they pay more, you know? So that, uh, I think that was one thing that people didn't like that, too. After the initial celebrations, the Americans were welcomed into French life for a considerable period of time. Romantic encounters were inevitable. I was walking to a dance and, uh, with my friend Jacqueline, and my, uh, we had to walk to the to the dance, and um, a big jeep came behind us and stopped and say it was dark by then, and they say, uh, do you want a ride? 
And we said no, because we didn't know him. We were too scared. However, after the acclaim, a certain amount of mistrust of GIs arose. In Normandy, people would say that during the occupation, they'd had to hide the young men to avoid them being enlisted for forced labor in Germany. When the GIs landed, it was the young women who were hidden. The GIs had come as liberators. They died for us. And so they saw themselves as real heroes. They felt that they could do no wrong and get away with anything. GIs saw Paris as a scene of promiscuity, and French women as nasty collaborators who could be defiled. From June to October 1944, the American army prosecuted 152 soldiers for rape. 29 of them were executed. Roger, the driver of the Jeep that Huguette refused to get into, was not one of the rapists. But the young woman certainly left an impression on him. We talked almost all night, and then uh, I went back home, and uh, but I gave him my address over in France, and, but I thought after a while, I said, he never found my house, but I was mistaken. Rod tried to see you get whenever he could, in spite of the laws getting stricter. In the U.S., the American government was well aware of the tidal wave of sexual desire released by the liberation across the Atlantic. Panic ensued. Eleanor Roosevelt took a stance and launched alarming campaigns to warn the soldiers of the dangers. The relationships were called marriages made in bed, which says it all. And since the Americans were so sure of having the greatest country in the world with the best way of life, they were convinced that if French women wanted to marry them, it was obviously not out of love, but simply because the women wanted a ticket to go and live in the wonderful United States of America. American public opinion forced the army to reinforce bureaucratic barriers to make these marriages impossible. But Rod was single-minded. He asked me, but what's more funny is that he asked my mother and my dad. <laughs> uh, when he asked me, yes, he did. He, he went on his knee, yes. <laughs> I remember that, but it was kind of like I was thinking about it. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, everybody loved him. <laughs> and, uh, and I love him too, dearly. But I guess on your heart, you know, if it, it is a one, I think you just know. While Paris was being liberated and taken over by the GIs, Berlin was undergoing intense bombing. Around 20,000 Germans died under Allied firepower. But it didn't stop the Nazis from hunting down Jews and slaughtering them. August 21st, 1944. For the homosexual lovers, Felice, the clandestine Jew, and Lily, the housewife of the Nazi bank clerk, they couldn't know it, but they were enjoying their last moments of happiness together. They drove there by bicycle and came home by bicycle and ran up to the apartment and there, this friend opened the door and just uh, said, so they knew that Gestapo was inside waiting for Felice. Felice was arrested at Lily's home. The reason given, for being a Jew. She was immediately transferred to Berlin's Jewish hospital, which had become a detention center during the war. Lily, the housewife, was distraught, and she too was brought before the Gestapo she was accused of having hidden a Jew. They told her, uh, you should, we should actually put you into prison or send you to a camp, but because of your poor four children, we're not going to do that, but uh, just take care, yeah? And they didn't really believe her that uh, she didn't know that, uh, that uh, Felice uh, was Jewish. Felice was deported to the Theresienstab concentration camp, 200 miles north of Prague. Her friends were very happy when they heard she, she was sent to uh, Theresienstadt, Theresien, uh, because they hoped that she would uh, survive, because it was obvious that the war was lost and uh, they were approaching the end of the war. 
But it was Lily who sealed Felice's fate when she decided to visit Theresienstadt at the end of September 1944. She managed to get right into the camp and she told the camp leader, I want to see my friend Felice Schradenheim. And he, uh, of course, was uh, out of his mind with anger. And of course, Lily never managed to see Felice. By drawing the camp leader's attention to Felice, Lily only helped to speed up the death sentence of her lover. A few days later, after this visit, Felice was deported to Auschwitz. And from Auschwitz, further to, to other camps. When I saw the closeness in the dates of Lily's visit and Felice's deportation to Auschwitz, I was quite shocked, I must say, yes. From Auschwitz, Felice was then transferred to a camp in Silesia, and then to Bergen-Belsen in Lower Saxony. When the British Army found this death camp on April 15, 1945, they came across a vast expanse of corpses who died of hunger, thirst, and illness. She died of typhus or of one of the illnesses. So she was not killed, she was not gassed. She died at the end of the war. So she nearly uh, had uh, survived the war. Lily returned to Berlin with no news of Felice. She would have to wait three years before getting official confirmation in 1948 of her lover's death. Their same-sex relationship had not withstood the war, pushed over the precipice by the Nazi regime. Lily was inconsolable. She received the Cross of Federal Merit in 1981, the highest possible German award, and then in 1995, the honorific Righteous Among the Nations. She died in 2006. Fatal love the tragic end to this forbidden couple. The same fate could have befallen Raymond Bouton, the Krautstart, and her German officer, Joseph van Mierlo. In France, fighting between the Allies and the Germans hadn't stopped since the Normandy landings. My dear godmother, no couple is happier than we are. Of course, it's dangerous all along the coastline. There are planes overhead all the time, bombs, artillery fire, but what can you do? It's all very risky. You can't have it all. Inevitably, fate would come between Raymond and her lover. In September 1944, after an attempt to counterattack in northern France, the Wehrmacht was defeated by the Americans. Officer Van Mierlo was taken prisoner. They were surrounded by the 1st Armored Division and captured. They were taken across France, paraded down the Champs-Élysées in trucks, so that people could throw stones and all sorts of things at them. Following this humiliation, Van Mierle was transferred to the U.S., where he spent three years as a prisoner in the cotton fields of Arizona. Back in France, Raymond Bouton was alone and desperate. The war had taken away her reason to live. She'd lost the man she loved, and it was the only thing that mattered to her. She started wandering through fields in the early morning dew like a zombie. Setting out from the Bay of Somme, Raymond tried to return to the Parisian suburbs. She absolutely had to avoid capture by the French forces of the interior, who were hunting down the Krautstarts. The purging had begun. The women were punished publicly by having their hair shorn. They weren't shaved for having slept with Germans. They were shaved because they were accused of having collaborated in one form or another. Being shaved had a sexual connotation because hair was a symbol of seduction. Hair was intrinsic to being a woman, so the sexual symbolism was very strong. Exhausted, after a month of walking through the countryside, Raymond arrived one night in Orsay, where her mother hid her in a neighbor's cellar. It was there that she realized she was in danger of being shot. This was the liberation after all. She could see what was going on around her and she became very afraid. But Raymond's mother was quite astute. She knew Orsay's FFI. They were just youngsters whom she'd seen grow up. She convinced them to leave her daughter alone, especially as Raymond had just found out that she was pregnant. 
I was born on the day the Germans surrendered. In other words, on the day my father lost the war, he gained a daughter. So I think he came out pretty well. Josiane is one of 200,000 children born to Franco-German couples in France during the war. This number helped contribute to the notorious baby boom. There was an increase in the number of illegitimate births in France at the time, and in some regions, a very significant increase. The national average was 6%, but in certain areas, it was as high as 8.5%, in particular in the parts of the northern zone, which had been occupied the longest. Joseph could have easily forgotten Raymond, but as soon as he was released by the Americans, he found out that he had a daughter. And the Van Mierlos didn't abandon their children. In 1948, the family encouraged him to move to Orsay, where he was one of the first Germans to obtain a post-war residence permit. The Franco-German family had to put up with insults and threats for the next 10 years. Four years of occupation were not easily erased. As for G.I. Rod Rusher, in spite of the rules and the anti-French campaign in the U.S., he married the young French woman Huguette Fauveau in Paris on September 22, 1945. Straight afterwards, he returned to the United States to look after the family ranch. Huguette had to wait her turn. She had to pass through the Philip Morris camp, one of eight G.I. camps in the outskirts of Le Havre. Huguette and hundreds of other war brides found themselves in this city within a city in May 1946. It was huge. We all had a little bed. I guess it must have been not too bad because I, I don't remember having backache. <laughs> they were designated places to read, to write. They had their own postal service. There were cookery classes, sewing classes. And it might have seemed wonderful, but it was all designed to supervise the women and turn them into good American wives before they immigrated. They were taught how to make cookies and basically how to become the perfect housewife. Their health was checked rigorously, too. They were examined and vaccinated to ensure they didn't bring any diseases into the country. Huguette spent five days and nights in the Philip Morris camp before boarding a cruise liner for New York along with 6,000 fellow French women. Then she took a train to Chicago and finally to the town of Roundup in Montana. A two-week journey for a young woman who'd never left Europe. And then I, I see him just like in a movie, you know? I mean, a, a cowboy hand, cowboy shirt, cowboy boots. <laughs> when he was working uh, on a grave registration, he was dressed like an officer, you know? I mean, really nice thing. And I come back and I see this cowboy, <laughs> so different. <laughs> but he was uh, really, uh, he was really nice. I don't know. Really, I, I loved him very much. Just like in a Western, Huguette became a cattle raiser in the United States. It wasn't what she'd ever imagined her future to be. However, her happiness was short-lived. While she was expecting their second child, Rod died in a plane accident in 1948. Despite this, Huguette stayed living in the U.S. The end of April 1945, the British Army in Germany had reached the Baltic Sea. The young Gertrude and her French lover, Maurice Robert, had been spotted together by the Gestapo, but had escaped its clutches. Unfortunately, however, the arrival of the Allies spelled the end of their love story. This ended. This Maurice period. stayed until the end of the war. No, I'm so right up to May 8, 1945. He was still here a week later. But once the Russians had arrived, it was clear that he wanted to return home. But Gertrude found out that she was pregnant. She tried to hold on to her lover, 
in a letter that she passed on to one of his comrades in the prison camp. Did he ever receive it? Whatever the case, Gertrude was now alone with her huge secret. In my fourth month, my mother realized that I was pregnant. I told her that it had been a one-night stand. I certainly didn't tell her that the father was French. I only told her the truth much later, after the baby had been born. So Gertrude brought up her daughter, Barbara, alone. The child of shame found out at the age of 13 that her father was a French soldier, one of the enemy. As an adult, Barbara set about trying to find her father, whose family name she didn't even know. More recently, she carried out some genetic research. I found out that I had Sephardic Jewish origins. Since this part of my DNA cannot come from my mother, it had to come from my father's side. Unfortunately, the DNA test couldn't reveal more than that. Neither half-brothers nor father. Her final hope is to go public in order to try and reconnect with Maurice Robert. My father's descendants might possibly see this documentary. I imagine that he will have told them the story of his captivity. In particular, the place in Germany where he worked when he was a prisoner of war. So, I hope with all this information, members of his family will connect the dots to me. So, 75 years after what happened, Barbara and her mother Gertrude still harbor the hope of tracking down the French prisoner of war, Maurice Robert, a trace of this forbidden love. Gertrude and Maurice Robert, Raymond and Joseph, Lily and Felice, Rod and Huguette. As the poet Blaise Sombrars wrote, above all, the war transformed love. Time has moved on, but these hidden stories of forbidden love are only now being revealed. It's very difficult to admit to having fallen for the enemy, to have believed in the freedom to love against all odds.